Welcome to our last segment of the Historic Bus Tour. We are at Zelinsky's Historic Tavern and Ballroom in Plasky, Wisconsin. Welcome back to our Historic Bus Tour of Plasky for our final segment. What if I told you that there was once a community in Northeast Wisconsin that was home to over 500 families and not a single drinking establishment before Prohibition? No taverns, no saloons, no off the main drag countryside bars. That community? Why Plasky, of course. It was October 10, 1894, and the Catholic Fathers of Green Bay had just returned from Hoff's Polish colonies of Huffa Park and Plasky in complete astonishment and in praise of the Poles' rejection of intoxicating liquors. Vicar General Fox commented to the press in Green Bay that without the mass consumption of beer and hard liquor, the Polanders were industrious, tidy, healthy, and prosperous. And while he wasn't naive enough to believe the Poles weren't complete ab abstainers, he felt that with the ardent work of the Franciscan brothers, Hoff's Polish colonies would one day be shining beacons for the temperance movement. Fast forward a decade and the colony was dotted with saloons and dance halls. In our last leg of the tour, we will be discussing the early years of the saloons in the greater Pulaski area. This is a subject that comes close to my heart as several of the early saloons in and around Pulaski were owned by my ancestors. The early Highview Saloon by Frank Karch, the saloon of his stepmother, Frances Karch, and the Ketch Saloon in Angelica. During Prohibition, my great-grandfather, Stephen Karch, was a bootlegger out of Maple Grove, and after the 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933, many of the family went into the tavern business. Alex Karch, Anton Karch, Dora Mansky, and many others over the following decades. In Plasky's early days, saloons were only allowed west of St. Augustine Street in Shano County, in Maple Grove and Angelica Townships. Even now, looking at the traditional lines of the village, you find almost all the bars located west of St. Augustine Street. One of the earliest establishments in Plasky was a saloon owned by John and Gertrude Vichkowski. The Vichkowskis came to Plasky from Chicago around 1894 and built their small saloon on West Plasky Street right across from the old Five and Dime store. Mr. Vichkowski died in February of 1905 and his son Adam took care of the saloon. Gertrude by this time was 60. Five years later, his sister Josephine took over the place under the feminine Wachkowskas. On January 15, 1915, Josephine married Vincent Zolinski and Gertrude died the following June, leaving the place to the newlyweds. Over the years, Vincent made many enhancements to the place, adding the dance hall in 1933. In those early years, the dance hall was the host to wrestling matches and roller skating. Polka music only came later. Josephine Wachowska wasn't the only woman to have a bar in Pulaski. In 1906, the patriarch of my family, Matthias Karch, passed away and his second wife sold the farm in Angelica and moved with her six children to Pulaski, right across from St. Augustine Street next to the Legion Hall. Why Francis took up the being a proprietress of a saloon is open to debate, but it might have been due to the limited prospects for women in the village or because other members of the family had already opened up saloons of their own in the community. After Frances passed away, her son, Alex Karch, took over the saloon for a time. Another early saloon owner was Joseph Kurowski. He built the bar that would become Rogers Corner Club. It was also owned by Frank Peplinski and later Joe Noose, who ran it as a veterans bar. Several of the community's earliest settlers were saloon keepers. Lorenz Szymanski, Steve Kurowski, George Pulaski, Walter McTaki, Thomas Kolacheski, and Henry Gajewski, to name a few. And Pulaski wasn't the only community drowning in suds. We shouldn't forget John Zwicky of Huffa Park and Big Joe Stashik's place off the dam in Krakow. After 1910, things changed greatly for the saloon keepers in this area. Decades prior had seen the rise of the temperance movement, and religious officials in both Brown and Shano counties were urging God-fearing folks to totally give up alcohol, a social evil of the day. In some places, saloon keepers were seen as social pariahs. In Ishpigmig, Michigan, Lutheran authorities forbade them from attending church services. Saloons were seen as dens of ill repute, and it's in places like Angelica, wandering ministers invited a temperance group, the Good Templars, to take root amongst the lumbermen and their families. Social activists of their day, among the policies of the Good Templars, advocated limiting liquor licenses to one for every 250 residents, 
Pulaski had 800 residents in 1916, and using chewing gum as an alternative to alcohol. Anxiety over the rise of alcoholism led to a real scrutiny of those operating saloons in Pulaski. In 1910, a series of ordinances were put in place to regulate the businesses. Saloons were to be closed all day, every Sunday. Any other day, they could be opened at 4 a.m. to midnight. Foul language within the premises was illegal, as was lewd behavior and gambling. In one court case in 1904, George Pulaski, saloon keeper from Pulaski, demanded a jury trial over charges of foul language. His peers found him guilty in less than 60 seconds. George didn't learn his lesson as charges came up again in April of 1910, where he was found guilty once again and fined $12.15. One village marshal, Stanley Blahoviak, actually lost his job in 1917, in part because he was caught playing cards after hours at Francis Karch's saloon. You could have a pool table in your saloon, but the village taxed you $5 every year per pool table. Besides liquor licenses, the village also charged for cigarette licenses. 20 miles away in De Pere, additional ordinances were placed, including an order that saloon keepers keep window shades up so that passerbys could ensure that no illegal misdeeds were occurring within the premises. Both the health board and village marshal Jerome Jarrock were kept busy monitoring the sanitary conditions within the saloons. Most relied on houses, which were a real concern, not only for the smells, but for the spread of diseases in the community. Beyond policing the saloons and dance halls, the village marshal combined the duties of peacekeeper, dog catcher, sanitation officer, and public works chief in one full role. Being known as the town drunk wasn't an easy thing to shoulder either. In cases of habitual public drunkenness, the village board actually had the power to order that specific individuals not be served in saloons. In a practice known as posting, flyers were made up and distributed to the saloons by the village marshal, ordering that no alcohol was to be served to offenders. Postings typically lasted one year, and if found drinking in the establishments, the village marshal could find the saloon owner. Posting could extend beyond the borders of Pulaski, as was the case of Frank Kozlowski in September of 1916, who was posted in Maple Grove and Angelica as well. If that form of public shaming wasn't sufficient, the village board next sent out the marshal to detain the offenders so that they could be publicly placed before the board to explain themselves, as was the case in May 1916 for Matt Lattice and Mike Pollock. After World War I ended, the temperance movement took hold over the American people, culminating in 1919 with the introduction of the 18th Amendment, known as Prohibition. In February of 1920, the village refunded $83.35 for the liquor licenses of that year, and those saloon keepers who hoped to stay in business were reopened as non-intoxicating soda pop parlors. W.H. Roppel of RARS Distributing, Vincent Zielinski, Frank Baker, Harry Gajewski, John Saranowski, Steve Kurowski, and even Francis Karch took this route. The next 13 years would prove difficult for the saloon owners and their families, and the American people in general, as federal agents raided farms and businesses around the village, gangsters trafficked corn mash, the stock market crashed, and the Great Depression set in. But those are stories for another day. As curator of the Pulaski Area Historical Society, I'd like to thank you for joining us on our first virtual tour of Historic Pulaski. If you would like to comment, share stories, or have any questions on any of the topics we've covered, you can find a link for the Pulaski Area Historical Society at the end of this presentation. As always, donations are greatly appreciated. Or better yet, become a member of the fine organization, and once the pandemic lifts, visit our museum in Pulaski. Or you can make an appointment. You don't have to be a member. I hope, I hope you have enjoyed your time with me, and I look forward to having you all join us again next year. Take care, and thank you.